Good morning, everyone, and thank you for attending today's webcast, Autodesk Inventor Customizing the Content Center. Our presenter today is Kindred Cooper. He is a solutions engineer with Hagerman & Company. Before we get started, I want to let you know that you're in listening-only mode. If you have questions during the presentation, you can type them into the question panel on the right-hand side of your screen. They'll be addressed at the end of the presentation. As we close down the session today, you'll be prompted to fill out a survey, and we ask that you take a few moments to fill that out. Additionally, all registrants will receive a follow-up email containing a link for the recording of this presentation. And with that, I'm going to hand things over to Kindred. Thank you, Ashley. Greetings, everyone. Let's just go ahead and jump right into it. Again, my name is Kindred Cooper. And today we're going to be discussing Autodesk Inventor and how to customize the Content Center. So a few basics before we really get started in this. Uh, everybody should be hearing me right now. Uh, this slide is for those who cannot hear me, but it also points out the question and answer log that we're going to be using uh, during the meeting and at the end. So if you have any problems seeing or hearing audio cutting in and out or anything like that, you can submit the question into that log and it will be addressed. And then at the end we'll have designated time for uh, questions and answers. <clears throat> so let's jump in. A uh, quick inter introduction into the Content Center. A uh, little thing I don't have in here in my slide is the last count that I heard from Autodesk was the Content Center has approximately 1.8 pre-configured components in it. And that's a lot of stuff. And taking it right out of the box, you've got all of the different standards to sort through. You've got the ANSI, the ISO, the DIN, the JIS, all that stuff to, to filter through. And there are utilities there to help you do that. But on the same respects, what comes out of the box, the naming, the path at which locations, uh, files are saved when you bring them out of the content center, all of that doesn't always fit into your own company standard. So one of the biggest reasons to customize the content center is to reduce how many components are there. Okay, so if it is 1.8 million components, I don't know of any companies that use that many purchased parts in their design, except for maybe NASA. Uh, with everybody else, we have a select handful of things that we use. Uh, for most companies that I've encountered, at most you might have basic components talking about uh, basic standard inch bolts, basic standard metric screws, or washers, or bearings, or circular clips. When you look at just the basic component shape, there might be 100 or 200, maybe 300 components purchased. So yeah, you, you buy bolts, but you buy various bolts, various lengths, maybe different styles of hex head, hex flanged head, things like that. But in the general scheme, 300 components on average. So you want to customize the content center to reduce that 1.8 million down to something much more manageable. Uh, the other reason to tweak it is to change the file names that they use. Anybody who's dealt with the Content Center for a while now, we're all familiar with the very lengthy file name that Autodesk assigns to these components. Sometimes those names make sense to us. Other times, it takes a little bit of a learning curve to really process and understand what that name means. And trying to find it in the Content Center after that uh, can sometimes be a challenge. So changing the names to fit your company standard whether it be an actual name convention used or a part number, an intelligent part number, what have you, you can tweak it to fit that and conform to that. Another reason to do that, obviously, is also materials. While you can place from the content center and place things as custom, which allows you to control the file name that you save it as, and then you can edit it and tweak the material, Sometimes you might have to do that every time you place that component out of the content center because maybe you can't find where it's stored on the server. Various reasons you may have to repeat that process. So your, your lead time on your design is getting longer because you're having to repeat steps to go back in and change the file name, go back in and change the material for a bolt that you've already used 50 times in other places. 
the other benefit for customizing Content Center is creating unique components to put in there. Uh, we all have our own little brackets or housings or bearing or pillow blocks or things that we use that aren't in the Content Center that we buy separately or we make and we can add them to that Content Center to populate a library. So more on the benefits of the Custom Content Center, you're going to reduce your design time. You can standardize your component naming to fit your company standards, which is going to cut down on your errors because everything is driven from that database table. Reduce duplication because, again, you're pulling from that common library. You don't have to go in there and uh, edit that file name every time or edit that material every time. And any changes made to the library are going to affect all components you pull out of that library in the future. So with that, the question that always comes up, okay, well, what about the components I've already used? There's no utility or process in place when you change the library that it's going to go out and change or update any components in use. The biggest benefit or biggest um, uh, way or easiest way to rectify that is to use Autodesk Vault because with Vault, yeah, you can change your master database and change the contents, like if you change from a particular material of steel and change it to stainless steel, you want to change all of the assemblies out there that use that component and change that component to stainless steel. Vault will allow you to run the searches to find all the instances of that component so that you can change it and get everything updated. <clears throat> so what are some negatives to customizing? Regardless of what you're customizing, sometimes there can be drawbacks. Whether you're customizing an interface, an application, customizing something in AutoCAD, you can sometimes have some negative impacts that you've got to kind of work around. And seeing various customers do this, various industries, various um, design applications, the only two main negatives, and I use that term loosely, the only two main negatives that I can come up with are here. Uh, maintaining a library database on each system. So in setup of the content center, you can either have the content center on each station, on each CAD station, or you can map it to a network share. The most advisable approach, especially if you're doing customizing, is to have it on a network share. Uh, if that's not an option for you, maybe network speed is an issue or network storage is an issue, you can have it on each machine. The downside to doing that is if you change a content center, a custom content center library, you have to update that on each machine. Depending on how many CAD stations you have, that could be very quick, five minute job, or could be a little bit longer. The only other negative I could come up with is when you change from inventor release to inventor release, so you you create a library in 2015, and then you upgrade your inventor to 2016. You're going to have to migrate that custom library. And I list these as an issue simply because it's a step you have to take after you've customized it. That's the only thing that really quantifies it as an issue. Not that it's an issue in any other sense. It's not a difficult task to update each system to have the local library updated to that, that new standard. It's also not a difficult task to run that migration utility. It takes a few seconds and it's done. These are the only two drawbacks I could come up with. So running that update utility will migrate it to the current partition. So if you're on 16, it'll migrate it to 16. If you're on 17, migrate it to 17, so on and so forth. What gets installed by default? A lot of stuff, <laughs> to put it short and sweet. Uh, you've got all of your different main standards out there, your ANSI, your DIN, your GOST, ISO, GIS, GB, your other library, your Inventor other library uh, includes some of the less popular or less commonly used uh, standards, your Inventor feature libraries, some basic shapes, conic shapes, cylinder shapes, box shapes, things of that nature. Uh, Parker has their own library in here for uh, tube and pipe fittings. You also have a routed systems library if you're using the routed systems module of Inventor. And you have sheet metal for sheet metal fasteners. <clears throat> Those are your standard read-only libraries. 
there's no way to make these writable. They're stuck and locked at read-only. So to start out customizing, you need to make a new library. One of the best resources to go through and, and follow is the Inventor Help System. They've got this process pretty well documented. That being said, not many people like to read that much. So we decided to present this webinar to give you kind of a step-by-step -step workflow. What I'm going to be doing is I'm going to follow through a basic setup process. I am going to give you the different steps. You can follow this video step-by-step -step and get your own custom library set up, configured, mapped, and you're rolling. Now, I'm not covering every single option you can do. That would take too much time. I'm not covering a vaulted situ uh, situation. It's very similar. There are some different steps in the beginning, but after that, it's pretty much the same. Uh, for any kind of vault interaction customization, we recommend that you contact us to, to step in and help you with that. So it's basically a three-step process, three main steps. Uh, your first one, you're going to create that read-write user library. You're going to add that library to your current project. Your second step is you're going to add content to your library. Various ways you can do this. You're either going to take what's there, kind of copy it over. You're going to create your own, add to it. Your third step is modifying that content in your custom library. So just diving right into it, let's get started on step one. We're going to create that read-write library. So I'm going to jump over into Inventor. The very first thing you need to do, working with an Inventor project file. You see I've got a custom content center project file going. Down in the bottom, I want to point out that there's various things that come into play with the content center. The first thing that comes into play is the location of your libraries, the location of the database that you're actually going to copy and, and tweak. That location is not this path under folder options. That's not what that equals. This is something entirely different. So just so we're all on the same page, under your tools ribbon, under application options and the content center tab, that will show you where your master libraries are located. So looking in that folder, I see all of my standard, 2017, ANSI, DIN, Feature, all these other standard libraries. Then I've got my custom content center library. I also have a couple others in here. I'll get to that later. But this is the location that I installed them at. So when your software is installed, there is a default location. You can change that location and customize it. But if you're ever wondering where those libraries are, where those master databases are, application options, content center tab, there's your path. Now this is using it under the Inventor desktop content engine. This is uh, setting up a local or a network share. If it's a vault situation, then they're going to be mapped and you're going to point to the vault so you'll know they're already loaded there. But in a non-vaulted situation, they're going to be either on your local hard drive or on some network share. So notice that path, C slash Inventor 2017 desktop. When I go back to my project file, and I look in my folder options, notice this path is different. C slash users, username, documents, blah, blah, blah. This is the default location when you create a new project and you don't tweak this path. If you just accept the defaults, that's where everything is going to go. So what happens is when you pull a component from the content center, when you open or place, we'll say, a half-inch bolt, when you open or place that bolt, Inventor reads the database reads that table of information, instantaneously creates that component, and has to save that somewhere. It's creating a file. Just like we create a new part file or a new assembly, Inventor's doing the same thing. It's creating a new part file. It has to have a location to save it. So if your application options are set to Content Center Standard, just so you know what I'm talking about, back in here on that same tab, if everything is set to as standard, then what Inventor does is it creates that component and puts it in that location, the location listed in your project file under folder options. 
Again, this is choosing the default path. Uh, one of the things that I tend to advise is when working with this path, my recommendation is to edit that path and take out the version number. I have seen that cause multiple issues when upgrading from one release to the next because a lot of times Inventor will not see the components because it's looking for a 2017 path and the components were originally created in a 16 or a 15 or a 14 or a 13 path. So my first piece of advice is take out the version number, just lead it up to the content center's path, content center files path and stop it. That way when it creates those components, it'll nest everything under that master directory and it'll never not find them. So step one, tweak that path, get it set and, and have it be more generic. The next thing to do is you can tell your project file what content center libraries to work with. And that is done using this little icon in the lower right hand corner. That icon, little known guy underneath it, is labeled configure content center libraries. Brings up an interface that shows you the path to your library databases shows you all the different libraries that you have mapped or associated with your project file. So looking down through here, I've got all my standard libraries associated. By default, Inventor creates a read-write library for you and it's called My Library. It's very generic. You can use that one if you want or you can make your own. We'll walk through that in just a moment. Looking in here, we've got the custom content center library that I created. Notice there are only three read-write libraries associated with this project file. If I uncheck a library, that does not delete the library. All that does is disassociates it from my project file. So if I come in here and I uncheck ISO, GOSS, DIN, JIS, and GB, when I when I uncheck those and save my project file, when I go into the content center, I will not see any components that are covered by those standards. So it reduces how much gets loaded into the content center. The end result of the content center can be a little bit faster if you turn off stuff you don't need. So for here, I am going to have everything turned on. Everything's going to be associated. And what I've got, I've got the content center library that I created. I've also got an old one that I need to migrate. This is one of the steps you'll do coming from Inventor 15 to 16, and 16 to 17, and 17 to the next version. So it's very simple. Take your library that's associated with your project in the Configure Content Center Library interface. In the lower right hand corner, there is an update tool. When I click on that update tool, it gives a basic explanation of what's going to happen shows you any libraries that need updating. So if you have three or four libraries, you can have as many as you wish. If you make different designs for different customers, and each customer can have their own library if you want to go that route, and, and it kind of complicates the mix a little bit, but if that's what you need to do, that's what you need to do. So it'll list all of the libraries that need updating. Simply click through the prompts, and you'll see how fast this is. Goes through the library runs the update utility, translates all the data, and it's done. It only takes a few moments. The bigger the library, obviously, the longer this is going to take. Average size library, less than five minutes, probably less than three minutes. So that one is already done, already migrated. I can pull the information out of that library or write information into that library. To create your own custom library, that is done using the Create Library icon. Kind of looks like a book with a starburst coming off of it. You can also delete libraries. You can also transfer libraries from here into Vault and from Vault into here. And you can also look at the library pop properties. So what the library properties does is allows you to change the name of it after you've created it. So if you created it with a typo, you can go in there and fix that. So I'll create a brand new one. The name of it is just going to be December Content Library. It's that quick. I've got a new read-write library that is associated with my project, 
because of the check mark. So say OK. I've made changes to my project file by using that configure content center utility. I have made changes to my project file, so I will save those changes. It done. That's step one. Step two is adding content to the custom library. So right there, we've already got step one out of the way. Moving to step two, you've got various ways to add the content to the library. So I'll look at both uh, paths that you can take. On the tools ribbon, out to the far end, there is a content center tab. On that panel, you can use the content center editor and by default, it's going to show you what's called a merged view. So what that is, you'll notice the tree, everything is going to be blank. Or no, I'm sorry, not blank. Everything is going to be grayed out. And anything that you need to pull from here, you can pull it and copy it into your writable library. If you look at just, we'll look at the Inventor ANSI library, for example. If I look under the fasteners, under bolts, under hex head, if I look at the hex bolt inch, I cannot make any changes to any of these default libraries or any of the components that are mapped within those libraries. You have to get these copied into a writable library, so then you can tweak it. So the easy way to do that is simply find what it is you want to work on. I'm going to use a hex bolt metric for this workflow. Right click on it and you can various ways you can do this. Um, you can save the copy as a different name to your custom uh, writable library. Tweak the name if you want to. Tweak the family description and the folder name. It can be an independent library or it can link back to the source, to the parent. Where this comes into play is if the primary library changes, the hex bolt metric uh, component changes in the main read-only library, any future changes that are made to that, like if you upgrade from Inventor 15 to 16 or 16 to 17, maybe the standard change or the material spec change from Autodesk, it's also going to link to that and update your custom library. I do not know many uh, companies that are using this workflow. Most everybody goes independent and runs on their own. So you can use the save copy as, or you can simply just take it and copy it to whatever library you want to specify. So I'll copy it to my custom content center library. That'll be the one I work with. When I do that, you'll notice in the Inventor ANSI it stays grayed out. But if I switch my view and go back to merged view, it will now light up that hex bolt metric because that means it's now existing not only in my read-only libraries, but also in my read-write library, at least one read-write library. I, have a ha I happen to have multiple, but it's only existing in one. So if I change my view and I go look at my custom content center library, you notice my selections windows down. I don't have very much in there yet. I'm kind of getting started and putting things in here. So I've got hex bolt inch, hex bolt metric, and I've got a company standard hex bolt inch. It can be your company name or however you want to configure this. Uh, you want to rename it, you can right click, you can go to the family properties. Brings up this dialog box to look at different information of the component library itself. Not necessarily the category, but the individual component. You can change your standard organization, manufacturer, spec, spec date, description, you can set up parameter mapping if you need to. You can change the thumbnail of it. If it's a very tweaked, very custom component, you might want to put a thumbnail image in here, whether you do that with a screenshot, something from the web, or a photo that you take. You've got a path where you're going to load that image from, and you can do any kind of linking for that component. So I've got this component in here. That's step two, adding the content to the library. That's one path you can take, just using the copy to or save copy as, and that will take it out of your read-only, put it into your read-write. The next method to add the content into your library 
if you've got your own part that you've already modeled, and this is a, a custom component, it could be a bracket, a custom housing, or whatever you want to put into your content center. If you've got that component you've already created, you can add that component into your content center. If you need various sizes of this component, it's best to create this as an I part, and then you publish the I part. So that's what I've got here. I've got an I part table with four component instances on it, just changing a couple of sizes. That's about it. I've got three key columns for the ID, the OD, and the thickness. Some of the components have a chamfer on the inside. Some of them don't have a chamfer. Once you have your I part configured on the tools ribbon, I'm sorry, not the tools, the manage ribbon on the content center panel where you have the editor, you also have a publish part icon. Now what that does is it allows you to specify what library you want to publish this component into, what units it's going to go into, then what category? Right here we're using the default categories. We can publish it into washers. We can publish it into a plain washer. If you want to use those categories, you can. Even though you haven't copied any components out of that category, you can still publish to that category. If you want to make your own categories, you can do that as well. So I'll back up and show you that. Back inside of the editor, where you've got the categories listed on the left, all you need to do is right click. Actually, you don't even have to right click on a folder just to get clarification on that. You can right click an empty space to make a category at the top level, or you can right click on one of the subcategory headings and create a category from there. So I'll make a master, a top level uh, category, and this will be called custom washers. Again, for the category setup, you can load an image, whether a small image, large image, you can load both of them. You can set a parameter mapping if you wish. And you'll now get a folder category with that custom washers. You can create subcategories underneath this if you choose. So when you're doing the publish part option, you can pick that category from this listing here. Pick my custom washers, any kind of parameter mapping I want to do, category uh, parameters, or any kind of table, table columns I want to pull in from the I part, you can do that. Setting up your key columns. Walking through the next dialog box, you're going to specify the family name, description, folder name, what spec it may adhere to, what revision spec. You can Keep what's here, you can tweak what's there, rename, however you want to specify for yours. Again, we're walking through the very basics of this. Go ahead and publish your component. Once it's done, it gives you confirmation. At that point, I will close out this component, go into my content center, open from that content center, and you'll see my custom washers category listed. There is the plain washer that I just published. So the two methodologies for getting components into the library are creating your IPARC and publishing that, or you can use the Content Center Editor and copy from an existing read-only database and copy it into your writable library. So that is step two. Step three, we're now ready to tweak what's there. Various ways you might want to do this, various regions you might want to do this. So looking in the editor, going into my hex head bolts, one of the biggest reasons is to reduce how much stuff is there. Again, 1.8 million components, that's a lot of stuff. Just looking at your standard hex bolt inch, if I right click and go into family table, this is a massive table of information. Actually, that's the wrong one. Let's do the metric because I've already tweaked that one. If I look at the metric one, again, pretty big table starting with a nominal diameter of 5 millimeters, going all the way up to 100 millimeters. Looking at the standard hex bolt inch from the ANSI library, when I look at that family table as it comes out of the box, 
you can already tell it's a large database table. It's taking a minute to pull up. Starts at a quarter 20, covers every one of the size increments up to 8 inches long, then it changes to a quarter 28. So looking down through the rows as I get to the very bottom, just with the hex bolt inch under the ANSI designation, there is 1,181 different bolts. That's how we get to 1.8 million components. These database tables get massive with some of these components. So one of the biggest things to do is to come into your custom library and tweak it. So if I look at my hex bolt metric table, let's say, well, I, I, use, I use a 5 millimeter bolt, thread length of 6 millimeters, I use the 8, I use the 10, but beyond 10, I don't use any of that for a 5 millimeter. I don't use the 12, 14, or any of that. Get up here, I might use three or four of those sixes, so I'll just use the control key and select these tables. I might use the first four 8 millimeters. I won't use any, any others, and I won't use anything beyond a 10. So I'll just come down through here and select all of these. just to make it quick and simple. I'm just left clicking and dragging to highlight those rows. You can also use shift select to go to the end. Once you have all the sizes you need selected, actually I'm going to use some 42s. I won't use any 48s. Once you have all of your sizes selected, right click on the rows, delete the rows. So that reduces your database table down to something much more manageable. So when you're sorting through, you don't have to get all these sizes that you don't use. You can come in and tweak the sizes, configurations, head height, wrench size, all this jazz. Over at the far end, what's more applicable and what most people want to change is the file name designation. They might want to change the material. Instead of being mild steel, maybe they want carbon steel. Now you can change stuff here in this table inside of Inventor or if you're more friendly working with tables in Excel you can always dump this out to Excel in a much more familiar interface where you can use copy and paste a lot easier. My apologies. Wasn't expecting that kind of a crash. So we'll get Inventor launched back up here. You can bring your information into your Excel spreadsheet, use your copy-paste to populate your materials, populate your file names, do sorting, do automatic numbering when you do your file names. So when I look at the editor and look at the component I've already done in the hex head bolt, I've already done a Hus Husky engineering for my company standard. When I look at the contents of this, the table is much smaller than the ANSI standard. I do have some half inch, 7 16 half is the uh, smallest one I'm going to use for the bolts. I've gone in and I've reconfigured the file names to be an intelligent six digit numbering system. It changes increments as the size of the bolt changes. I've changed the material properties to be a stainless steel, remapped the part number properties. You can also do custom uh, column properties in here. You can set up custom namings. You can create custom expressions where you combine certain columns. Maybe you're combining the file name and the material designation or the file name and the thread designation into that custom column, and you can map that to a custom I property of the component. So tweaking, by all means, you come in here, you set up the table, copy the information in. You can pull it out to Excel, tweak it there. For your custom components, that custom washer that I added, the same thing applies. You can go into the family table. You can add more instances. Even though I had four members in my iPart, I'm not limited to four. I can come in here and I can say, well, four was my starting number. I actually need 12 or 16 or 30 of these guys. So you can come in here and you can add the information to that database table at that point or, again, go out to Excel, add it in a much more familiar interface. Uh, let's see. The other couple of things you can do with the family itself is you can use the material guide to set up a material and populate the table. If you're using Excel, this is not as 
quick and easy. Excel is a little bit easier if you already know the materials you're going to uh, work with. You can also use the file naming utility to go through and do an automatic file naming change for the table. And you can move, once you create a library of components, you can move it or again copy it to other libraries. So this is useful if you have a custom library set up per customer you deal with. So customer A has a bolt configuration and they want a certain part number on that bolt configuration. Well, customer B has the same bolt configuration but they want a different part number. That's one of the examples where you would have a different library per customer gets a little bit you know, higher on what you have to manage. You've got more stuff you have to manage and work with, but it's completely doable and flexible enough to allow you to do that. If you realize that you don't need that component library anymore, you can always delete that family. That will erase the database for the component out of that database permanently. There is no going back. There is no undo to get this back unless you have a backup copy somewhere. So that was pretty short. To the point, we took basic uh, libraries, created a basic writable library. We copied information from existing libraries over into that custom library, and we tweaked the information in that custom library. Again, step by step, you can follow this uh, video once we get it posted, and you can walk through to set up your own custom library. If you need assistance in a vault situation, I highly encourage that you contact us. If you need assistance with further tweaks like doing column concatenation, doing custom columns and custom mappings for keys and parameters, definitely give us a call. We'll be glad to help you out in that avenue as well. So jumping back to it, I'm going to wind this up looking at the questions log just to address any questions that have come in. And I'm going to try to address these live. I'll see how well this works out on this little interface. Uh, first question is where do you find the migration utility? Uh, part of a new or update install. Uh, the migration utility is part of the project manager. So when you load the project manager in the lower right hand corner you've got the configure content center libraries icon and the update tool or the migration tool is listed here. The only way this is going to work is you have to have your custom library listed in the path that is associated with Inventor. This path is global to Inventor, not unique to your project file. So all of your custom libraries would have to be in this path. Once they're in that path, you'll see the name listed here and you'll see a yellow exclamation mark listed next to it. That lets you know you need to get that updated. If this is a, a little gotcha that comes up sometimes. If your custom library, let's say my library for example, it might be listed but it might not be checked. If you come into this interface and you see the library but it's not checked, the first thing you need to do is get the check mark next to it. You get that library selected so it's associated with your project. Once you do that, click OK, come out here and save your project. So that library has to be associated with your project file and your project file has to be saved. At which point you come back into configure content center libraries and run the update utility. If all, util if all libraries are up to date, the utility is going to come back and say, hey, everything's up to date or it's set to read only. You should be good to go. Uh, second question, are you able to do all of this if you don't have admin access? Very good question. And this is kind of a loaded question because what type of admin access are we talking about? Um, in a standalone install where your content center files are either local or out on the network drive, you could have a permissions issue there. If you don't have write permission, read-write permission to a network folder, then you're not going to be able to make changes. So you have to get with your IT department and have them give you read-write permissions to that network folder where your content center databases are. If it's on your system, depends on your Windows login. Uh, if your login is a Windows admin, then obviously you're going to have control and ability to tweak that. If your login is a power user or a standard user, as you go down the restrictions, you may hit issues. 
You may also have issues if your um, Windows UAC is set to anything above never notify. You could have a couple of permissions issues. So all of that is working with um, the install on your local system or install on the network share. When you're in a vault situation, I will say that you have two roles in vault that vault roles are separate from Windows user roles. Vault roles, roles function on their own. And in vault you have a vault admin role, then you also have a content center admin role, and you also have a content center editor role. So you've technically got three roles in vault. If you don't have one of those three roles, you're not going to be able to tweak your content center in that situation either. So if you're, you're having issues trying to tweak it and you can't, there's some permission issue going on somewhere. First stop should be your, your IT department and find out if you have read write permissions to your folders. If you're in a vault situation, then get with your vault admin and find out what kind of permission restrictions they have you under there. Uh, next question, is there a way to tie the content center generated parts to the vault so that they are linked as the same file? Okay. Um, the way this works is very similar to a local install. When you, when you pull components out of the content center, when you pull them out of that database, as I said earlier, Inventor takes a couple of seconds and it builds that part right then. When it does that, it has to save it somewhere. So in your project manager, under folder options, it's going to save it wherever this path is listed. So when you open it from the content center, place it from the content center, it generates that part and it saves a temporary copy in this location. When you add your assembly to Vault or check your assembly into Vault, there's a different folder path in Vault that is mapped or should be set up to be mapped. Uh, when we do a Vault install or Vault configuration, that's one of the things we do is we map out all the folders and all the paths for Vault so that everything uh, works as it should. So it should already be mapped and it's going to take it out of this temporary local path and put it into the vaulted path and everything will be linked accordingly. So when you, your assembly gets checked in the vault, it's taking that component with it. Now the next question that comes up, okay, what if I've already got this bolt out there in, in vault and I'm already using it somewhere? Is it going to overwrite that copy? No. The way the vault works is it sees, hey, this bolt already exists, same name, same destination path, that's the same file. That's how Vault works. It sees, okay, there's not any changes between these two, so when I add this assembly, I'm just going to link it to what's already there because it's the same bolt. It's the same configuration, same path, same file size, same apples. So it relinks it to what's already in the Vault. You still have that local copy that you generated when you placed it into your assembly. Nothing's wrong with that. You can delete that and clean house after the fact. It'll relink it to what's in the vault. So at this time, that looks like that's all of the questions. Uh, if any other questions come up, feel free to uh, submit them to us. We'll get, get on them and get them processed as quick as possible and get them answered. Uh, if you have any other needs where you want us to kind of look at your configuration and help you customize it, we can certainly uh, offer you a service to do that and take care of that or any kind of configuration needs in the vault for Content Center or outside the vault for Content Center. At this time I'm going to leave the questions window open for a few minutes to see if any other questions come in. I appreciate everyone taking their time and joining us today. I hope it was informative and again this video will help guide you through the basic steps uh, of setting up that custom content center and getting information in there. If you need any further assistance, please by all means contact us. I'm going to jump in here, Kindred, and um, let everyone know that if you think of additional questions, you can simply reply to the GoToWebinar confirmation or reminder email you received, and we can get those to Kindred or whoever to answer your questions appropriately. And um, 
Once again, if you could take a few moments to answer the short survey, we would appreciate it. It will just automatically appear as we close down today. Um, if there's nothing further, and I don't think there is, is that right, Kindred? Uh, there's one question coming in regarding the Styles Library. Uh, I'll go ahead and address that verbally, but that looks like the last question. The Inventor Styles Library is a little bit more detailed um, than what I've covered here, even in a basic sense, uh, covering the Style Library and customizing it. I, I don't think I could fit it into a one-hour webinar. Uh, we do have a webinar out there on a basic top-level overview of the Style Library and how it works. If you need some customization help with the Style Library, we can certainly offer a service for that. Uh, we also have a two-hour class for the Style Library on how to customize it, how to tweak it, that covers a lot of the scenarios for setting up custom materials, custom appearances, bringing in your own uh, images for your surface representations and things like that. So there are um, services we can offer, but to cover it in a one-hour webinar, there's a little bit too much there, to too much detail there to get it all covered in a step-by-step -step process. And Ashley, I believe that's all of them. Okay, well, this will conclude our broadcast. Thank you, Kindred, for the presentation. And thanks for everyone for attending. Have a great day.